Good afternoon. Welcome to the Force Majeure webinar. My name is Kristen Austin. I'm your Education Manager at the Commercial Brokers Association. As we get started, I have a few housekeeping items to mention. To minimize external noise, all attendees are muted. However, we highly encourage questions and comments. If you have questions, please submit them in the Q&A forum, which you'll find at the bottom of your screen. In the Q&A forum, you're able to upvote questions. We were able to open up the webinar to more than 100 attendees, so upvoting will help us prioritize your questions. If you're having technical difficulties with the webinar, please call 1-888-799-9666. Extension 2 for Zoom tech support. Zoom should be able to help you maneuver through troubleshooting options. However, due to increased traffic volume at Zoom, you may not be able to get through. If this happens, try logging in and log try logging out and logging back in. We are recording the webinar and it will be available on demand on the SEBA website later this week. Without further ado, I will turn this over to our presenter, Hunter Jeffers, an associate attorney at Stoll Reeves. Thank you. Thanks, Kristen. Um, I will share my slides now. All right, that should be visible on everyone's screen. Um, well, welcome and thank you for um, attending, all of you that are out there. Uh, as Kristen said, we'll make this available afterwards. Uh, it is being recorded. I'm also going to send out my slides uh, to Kristen. So all this information should be available to you. Uh, going forward. And of course, I give my uh, contact information here on the first slide. So if you have any questions, anything I'm not covering, um, you'll have an opportunity to do that at the end of each section in the Q&A. Uh, there's a little Q&A feature at the bottom. Uh, so don't hesitate to send those in. We did collect some questions beforehand that I'll answer as part of my presentation before I open it up. Um, but in case there's anything I don't cover or anything you're unhappy with or disagree with, don't hesitate to give me a call, uh, to shoot me an email, whatever it is, whether it's about the, the presentation uh, or anything else. So here's our agenda. Um, it's pretty simple. Uh, I'm trying to keep it simple. It's Washington specific. Uh, so first I'll touch on Washington Stay Home and Stay Healthy Proclamation, which as many of you probably realize, this is changing by the day. Uh, we had huge guidance issued on Friday, uh, huge for the residential industry more so than the commercial, uh, but it nonetheless impacts property management and, and everyone generally. Uh, my goal then is to, after answering some questions, give you a touch of what we as lawyers are dealing with right now. Um, first, if there is a, what's called a force majeure provision in the contract, that's also known as an act of God uh, provision. And just kind of walk you through our analysis. I'll, I'll probably say too many times that that's not analysis brokers should be doing. Um, especially now, it's not a time to sort of overexpose yourself to, to the risk of providing legal advice. Um, so I'll mention that a few times. Uh, the next section I'll talk about, what do you do when there's no force majeure provision, which is very frequent um, in the CEBA forms, that's the purchase and sale agreements. Uh, and the, the idea is that you fall back on common law. So there are defenses such as impracticability, impossibility, frustration of purpose, uh, legal defenses that still apply without a force majeure provision. That's good to be aware of, um, but again, something for your client to seek legal counsel on, uh, certainly. And then at the end, I'll touch on sort of what we're seeing at the firm, um, some difficulties. I'll touch on the electronic remote uh, notary act, things like that, that I haven't covered in previous questions, uh, some financing property management considerations. And my goal is just to keep going uh, and answering questions until we run out of time. It's uh, an unusual time. So I, I will ask right off the bat for flexibility here. This is incredibly fluid and we frankly just don't have the black and white answers that at least our clients need, which means your clients need. It's, it's evolving too rapidly. Um, we see orders getting modified or changed at a moment's notice. Guidance comes sometimes out of nowhere. Sometimes it's different than what we were lobbying for. Um, an hour ago, we got some more guidance on property management that I've included in this presentation. So that's just a good example that uh, it's really, really hard to set a concrete timeline in place for your clients, for yourself, uh, when 
when things can change, even the orders that have come down are 14 day, two week orders. Uh, so those by definition need to be extended, which means they could be eliminated, they could be modified or whatever it is. Um, if I don't know something, I plan to just say that, uh, but I'll provide some general guidance uh, on the best I can. There's really no precedent for this situation in Washington or anywhere. Uh, so we are all just sort of kind of giving the best of our analysis and then we go from there and answer questions that come up. Uh, it is April Fool's Day, so I do feel like I need to say I won't make any April Fool's jokes. I appreciate it. The questions don't either. Um, there's very little that's that's funny about this situation. Um, so it's, it's also not a, a very humorous set of slides, but hopefully it answers what you need to know. Okay, first section, um, a summary of the governor's stay home and stay healthy order. So I put on the, on the slides on the screen here, some basic components that you, you might already know. And the key word here uh, is essential. Essential activities, essential businesses. Um, under the order, everything is prohibited except for what's specifically allowed, what's specifically described. So if, if your activity isn't specifically described as essential, <clears throat> it's not allowed to be performed. Um, you see there, there's a ban on gatherings for social, spiritual, recreational purposes. Uh, it's closing businesses. And the key part is you're required to remain in your home. Um, you're only allowed to leave your home uh, for work purposes when it's for essential businesses or supporting essential businesses or performing essential activities. I already mentioned that this goes two weeks, uh, which is an, a great deal of time. Uh, it's an indicator both on the federal and the, and the state level and the city level that we're going, this is a fluid situation, as I said earlier, and it's going to be updated sort of as we go. Uh, and so again, we'll just have to respond the best we can as we get um, more guidance. So what's essential? I don't, I don't need to go through all of these, but it, this is just to give you an idea of how broad the order sometimes is. Um, there are a lot of essential activities relevant to our economy, and these categories make sense when you go through them. Food and agriculture, uh, healthcare, public health, emergency service providers, energy, things like that. Um, something you don't see broadly mentioned is real estate. Uh, and until the governor's order, that was, uh, sorry, the governor's clarification and guidance last Friday, that was a little bit up in the air in terms of all the things that are allowed to be done uh, or not. And then we received that guidance. And I think the big takeaway from that um, is that real estate brokerage itself is not essential. It's not an essential activity uh, in terms of keeping uh, this, this going. Um, it did allow for very limited residential real estate activities. And I put in all caps there that this does not apply to commercial real estate. And I usually don't like to use all caps, but here it's very important because we've received a ton of messages both in private practice and through SEBA uh, and other organizations indicating, woohoo, it's, it's business as usual. Uh, and, and frankly, that's just not the case on the commercial side. It's not the case on the residential side uh, either. But the idea behind this guidance from the governor, and if you read it, it focuses on people needing homes, needing shelter, transitioning between uh, housing. And so the, the purpose was a narrow order allowing transactions to close. Um, it's certainly a little bit broader than that, uh, but there are, there are very strict limitations that I'll touch on briefly here uh, that do allow real estate activity. Um, again, that's residential. It's, it's not commercial. Uh, so in terms of being a commercial broker at home, the rule is stay at home. And it's very important that we uh, pay attention to that because when the governor revisits this in a couple of weeks, we want to give every indication that the real estate industry, the broker industry on both residential and commercial uh, is taking this very seriously and is being very responsible. And perhaps that opens the door for a broader modification. Uh, we just don't know at this point. I put in this slide this morning um, to carve out property management, and that's based on some guidance that we just received. Um, WizCar is doing a lot of work in Washington, that's Washington Realtors in part, um, to try and clarify what is allowed and what isn't allowed. And this is very, very relevant to all of you doing 
um, leasing of multifamily properties. And again, you'll see the focus is on residential. Um, again, that's so people have homes. And here are the requirements I referenced earlier. So it's structured so that yes, residential, single and multifamily property management, including working with tenants is considered essential. However, they must comply with these requirements and they're pretty strict. They're pretty difficult to work under. Um, property visits by appointment only with no more than two people at a time. So if there's two tenants, they cannot be there meeting with the broker. Um, CDC guidelines must be followed. No open houses are allowed. Again, that's more for residential, uh, but it's worth including. Uh, and the CDC guidelines, I thought I'd provide them here, not because I'm qualified to lecture on what they mean, um, but because they're good to know in everyday life. And for those of you who are performing property management within these strict limitations, it's important to be very, very cognizant of these, both for your own safety and health, uh, but also for that of the people you're meeting with and anyone else who might visit the property. Uh, six feet away is probably the one we hear the most. Uh, but disinfecting surfaces is equally important, of course. I, I mentioned this earlier, but it's worth reiterating based on a lot of the feedback we've received and a lot of the activities we're seeing. Um, brokers across the country, unfortunately, have been reported to be showing houses, meeting with clients, continuing business as usual in shelter in place states, in non shelter in place states, and sometimes even after a diagnosis of the coronavirus. I think everybody out there knows uh, that, that you can have this virus without exhibiting symptoms. Um, so it's, it's really, really crucially important that although we are trying to work with the legislature and work with the governor to, to broaden activities that make sense, um, our first obligation is not to spread this virus and brokers are uniquely positioned to do so by visiting properties, by meeting with clients and by going out in the public. Um, so as we work through the challenges of what brokers are allowed to do or not to do, um, this is something that's important to come back to every time. It's, it's inconvenient for all of us, uh, but necessary. And so the extent you can stay home, you, you not only public health, but you prevent liability for yourself and for your firm. So here um, is a list of, of what commercial brokers are allowed to do. And, and this is probably the most important takeaway, but it's not going to be a, a great deal of new information for you. Um, provide services to clients rem remotely from their house. Uh, that's why I'm here, welcome to my home. I'm providing legal advice remotely from my home. Um, and, and there's a special emphasis on using technology services that are becoming increasingly available uh, for signatures, for data, for photographs, the marketing materials you already have. I'll touch later on electronic notary. That's becoming available on a short-term basis. Uh, so that, again, the takeaway is that at, at this moment, today, this hour, uh, commercial brokers must stay home. Uh, they are not allowed to go out and perform real estate activities uh, in the market uh, because it's not an essential activity. And here I kind of explain that nothing outside of the home, no showing properties, no visiting clients, no viewing properties, no taking photos, uh, etc. It's a little, it's a little frustrating uh, for, for many of my clients, at least because they see their residential counterparts are allowed to still do many of these things. Um, and they understand the reason for it that I explain that the focus is on housing and shelter. Uh, but I guess I'd emphasize these restrictions don't always make sense. Um, two people at a time seems arbitrary to me, but what do I know? Uh, I think the bigger takeaway is that we all have to live within the guidelines that are given us. We as lawyers, you as brokers, clients, everyone, and, and the focus should be on complying with those and, and you know, supporting your associations that are lobbying to do what makes the most sense. Um, but as we receive directives every day, we must comply with them as an industry so that we're seen as responsible uh, and we also put ourselves in the best position uh, to extend the governor's orders and perhaps expand it. And here's where I sort of summarize that. And uh, I, I don't need to say it all again, but 
if we're right in the middle or we're right at the start of this two week timeline. So um, like I said, this will be changing like mad very soon. We'll know a lot more. Uh, so with that, I'll get into some questions. I'll start with some of the questions we received leading up to the presentation. And then I will go to the Q and A feature and look at the questions that were submitted there. So please feel free to, uh, to submit them. Um, we are not doing verbal questions at this point. So please uh, submit them by the Q&A feature if you can. Uh, first question, what if a buyer or seller has questions about the rights and obligations under the purchase and sale agreement or lease? This is pretty straightforward, at least for me. Um, as always, brokers have a duty to refer their clients to an expert. And in that case, this would be an attorney. Um, matters affected by COVID-19 are changing by the day. Uh, so it's crucial that you do so uh, and you avoid interpreting the provisions for them, interpreting the lease, interpreting the purchase and sale agreement, whatever it is. It's good to have a general understanding as I hope you'll have at the end of today on what a lawyer is going to look at and think. Um, but with that information, it's important that you don't use it to advise your client uh, beyond the scope of, of a real estate broker's expertise. Can brokers continue to physically preview or show properties in any fashion, even alone? Can brokers or their representatives go to a property to provide access to a tenant or buyer before or after a closed uh, transaction? I think I answered this. This is one that is different in the residential context in some ways, uh, but the answer is no. Um, not to show properties, not alone. Um, not to, well, to provide access to a tenant or a buyer if within the scope of the residential property management, which is very specific, um, that would be the case for a tenant, but not a buyer because that is not. So the general rule is no, the commercial brokerage activities are not essential. Commercial real estate transactions are not essential. Um, so it's important to stay home. There's one in a bulletin that we sent out, there was some additional information letting you know that a broker can sort of arrange for an owner to leave keys at the property. So getting creative about things like that, um, where necessary in the scope of, of property management, for example, uh, is, is, is fine. Can I input new listings? Uh, yes, remotely uh, from home. Uh, that, that is allowed. Again, anything you can do from your home is great. Can you go out and hire a photographer to take photos, to take photos yourself? No. Um, you've got to use the information you already have. Can experts such as architects, engineers, surveyors, and inspectors perform work related to feasibility studies and due diligence? At this point, no, uh, frankly, that, that's, our, that's our best enter, uh, answer. The same reason that brokerage activities are not in the commercial context, um, we don't see that these services are considered essential either. Um, anything they can do from their home is great, uh, but in, unless we get, unless and until we have further guidance at this point, uh, no is the answer. And, and this is a tough one. I, I know there's a lot of questions to come on this, um, because you're suddenly talking about contingency deadlines and the ability to perform a contract. Uh, and that's where it becomes extra crucial to talk to a lawyer about whether this rises to a force majeure event, whether it makes closing impracticable, paying rent, uh, et cetera. But the thing to take away is right now, um, I imagine your architects, your engineers, your surveyors, your inspectors are in the commercial context limiting their performance to uh, staying at home. If you hear something different, please let us know. Different associations are getting different guidance, are talking to the governor on their own. Uh, movers, for example, we learned are allowed to do their work. Um, so we're still gathering information on what each little subset of the real estate industry uh, is allowed to do. Can the state of Washington revoke licenses and prosecute with criminal charges for failing to comply with the stay at home order? Um, I guess I would start by saying I think it's important to spend less time talking about what happens if I don't comply uh, to more more emphasis on complying. I think, you know, in terms of public health, we have a duty to do that. Um, uh, it is a misdemeanor. It is a criminal charge for failing to comply, for not staying home, for going out and performing uh, activities that are not essential. So, yes, there are severe uh, penalties. And yes, they can do that. 
Um, the director of the Department of Licensing is appointed by Governor Inslee. They have been step in step. So I would imagine, uh, if not a certainty, it's very likely that there are uh, licensing implications as well. Um, and there's implications for the firm as well. So um, again, I, I, would, I, I would not worry about what happens to me if I don't comply. I'd worry about how do I comply uh, to avoid that. Okay, so that's all the questions, at least on this topic that were submitted beforehand. I will go now to the Q&A and uh, answer some more. Got a question for once we get to a force majeure, I'll handle that then. What about providing maintenance services to commercial properties? Um, the maintenance is broad. Um, so within the scope of property management, if it's necessary for um, the way to look at all of these questions in that, in that context is, is it necessary for the essential business to perform or the essential activity to perform? In other words, if their heating goes out or their water is shut off, uh, that is maintenance that a property manager is allowed to perform in order for that essential business to continue operating. Uh, if it is not, uh, then it's much less likely to be allowed uh, you know, there's often indirect ways in which maintenance contributes to the building as a whole, uh, but that should be the focus of your analysis or your client's analysis in whether I can perform this maintenance is, does it support the essential business or essential activity that's performing at, um, at the property? What about doing uh, move outs as a property manager? Uh, that we receive that guidance about moving companies are allowed to move stuff in and out. They're not allowed to stay and set up. Uh, we, as far as we understand, staging isn't allowed. Um, but uh, it sounds like, yes, property, as far as we know at this point, a property manager can do move outs. Um, we're basing that on the guidance we've received in working with moving companies. Uh, but I, I would just encourage, again, limit those activities to whatever you can, whatever is possible. Um, it's, it's best not to sort of bend, uh, to bend the rule on these. I've got a question again on force majeure judgments. I will talk about that in a second and I'll come back to the question. Uh, and one more. Oh, here's a good question. Uh, if a bank orders a broker price opinion, is a broker allowed to complete that order since it is ordered from a financial institution? I don't know the answer to that question. Here's what I think. One uh, is a commercial brokers are not allowed to do broker price opinions generally. Uh, the same analysis I, I applied earlier is worth considering. In other words, is, is this to support an essential activity? Uh, is it to support a residential transaction closing? Um, maybe there's uh, an argument to be made that that's essential, but if it's a broker price opinion uh, that's for supporting a commercial transaction, I think you're in much, much shakier grounds uh, that since commercial activities are not considered essential. Um, obviously that puts you as a broker in a tough position because you're influencing um, someone's financing somewhere on a transaction. Uh, but hopefully the financial institution will can work with you on this because uh, it's a, that's a tough question, but, but I would say I'd lean towards no. Can employees travel to property management offices to collect mail and vital rent payments um, allowed during stay, the stay at home mandate? Uh, for residential purposes, absolutely. Um, the sort of essential activities that go along with performing the property management uh, is allowed. Um, Getting mail has been a particular challenge. Hopefully there's admin set up. Um, your offices are allowed to keep sort of basic admin going um, to help you with mail and things like this. So I would say try to set up procedures uh, to eliminate that travel wherever necessary if it's not in support of a, an essential activity. One more force, uh, force majeure event and then a question on 1031. I'm gonna save those to the end. So I'll leave them here in the queue. 
um, and come back to that. So without any further questions there, uh, I will move on to force majeure. Oh, here's one more, sorry, here I'm going back through. There's one more question. Does any of this change apply to medical office space? Uh, can contractors work on tenant improvements for medical office space? I am not an expert on what construction can do and cannot do. My understanding is that the only construction that's allowed is for uh, supporting the structural integrity of the building. Um, this here appears to be uh, construction that's necessary for an essential business. So I would assume there's an argument for that but I frankly just don't know. Um, I can easily find out. We've got a, a great group of, of uh, construction attorneys that, that I could send this over to. to. So I, I will do that. If you have this question, if this is curious to you, please email me hunter.jeffers at stole.com and I'll try to get you the answers. Just scrolling through these final questions. Okay. Force majeure. Uh, I said it earlier, but step one is, is talk to a lawyer. This is 100% a legal question. And I'll walk through what those legal questions are. And so hopefully by the end of it, you, you agree. Um, but this certainly qualifies as something to recommend that your client talk to a lawyer. I know that's self-serving. I know that's not real helpful sometimes for brokers, but it's so important that that's why I say it. Okay, force majeure. So this is a contractual provision. It's not a legal theory. So if it's not in your contract, it is irrelevant for you. Um, there's a different analysis that applies. Uh, so I encourage you, first step is to read your contracts. Like if you have questions, I'm sure you all have done at this point. Um, and, and the key thing here is that because it's a contract provision, it depends entirely on how that provision is worded. Um, and, and here are sort of the three questions that I ask, uh, the most general questions asked when you find one of these provisions in your contract. Uh, what constitutes a force majeure event, so the provision will define that. Two, does the force majeure event, if there is one, prevent the party from performing here? So it's not just a question of whether a force majeure event exists, it's a, it's a question of to what level is it interfering with the ability to pay rent, to close a transaction, to conduct inspections, uh, et cetera. And again, intensely legal. Um, and then finally, it specifies the remedy. So it's almost like a damages clause in the sense that it'll tell you um, what happens in the event there is a force majeure and it prevents a party uh, from performing. And so you really live within the confines of the words in that provision. So it's worth reading over and over and over again uh, to know what, what a, a lawyer uh, will say. So here it is in the SEBA forms, there's no force majeure provision uh, in, the, in the purchase and sale agreements. This is not uncommon. Parties rely on common law. Um, already put out a force majeure addendum in case the parties want to incorporate that provision into their purchase and sale agreement. And they can simultaneously uh, negotiate the remedies I mentioned, extension of closing, uh, extension of other deadlines, things like that. Um, so you can find that in the legal library. And if you have any questions, don't hesitate to ask us. For the leasing folks, you'll notice you do have a force majeure provision. Um, that's where it is in the single tenant leases, the multi-tenant leases and the real estate lease. Um, and I included what that provision says in each of those leases here. Um, so time periods for either party's performance under any provisions of this lease, excluding the payment of rent, are extended for periods of time during which the party's performance is prevented due to circumstances beyond such party's control. And then it lists out examples, which are without limitation, so it includes more than that. But fires, floods, earthquakes, lockouts, strikes, embargoes, government regulations, acts of God, etc. So what does that all mean? Well, here are the questions and we, we can get into each one of them and I'll, I'm not gonna spend a ton of time doing this. I'll, I'll try to prioritize getting to your questions, but I do wanna walk through what that provision says. 
in case that's helpful. So what constitutes a force majeure event? Well, here's what it says, circumstances beyond the party's control. So whether a coronavirus pandemic qualifies um, within the guidance of the examples here uh, and as a circumstance beyond the party's control, again, is an analysis for an attorney. I think it does. I think it's very likely that it does. I'd be surprised if it doesn't. And I'd be surprised if a judge decided that this pandemic, as extreme as it is, doesn't qualify. Um, so that's not a decision to be made. It's a decision for each attorney to make on their own. Um, but that's the language you look at. And you see it's very concise on purpose. The, the reason I think it likely qualifies is because the pandemic is by definition outside of um, the party's control. Number two, does it prevent the party from performing? So you'll see that's expressly in the provision during which the party's performance is uh, prevented. So again, it's not a question of how necessarily just how severe this pandemic is. Uh, it's a question of causation, really. It is the pandemic preventing your client or a party um, from performing under the contract? And again, this is even more legal in a sense of what, uh, what's enough. Uh, so is it enough that an inspector can't go out to the property and do his work? Uh, is it enough that financing has fallen through, but, the, uh, but it's outside the contingency period? Uh, these are all questions that I'll, I'll touch on in, in the examples coming up, um, but it's, it's very situation dependent. It's very situation dependent. It depends on the resources available to that client. It depends on alternative remedies, et cetera. So we'll, we'll touch on that in a second. Um, and then the final question is looking at the remedy. So in that provision, it says the time periods for either party's performance under any provision of the lease are extended, uh, excluding rent. So here, remedies, your time periods are extended, but rent is still due, period. Uh, you can look at the definition of rent in the CEBA form, see because it's capitalized, to know what that includes. Um, but the idea here is this is where you could spell out other damages if you so wished, but these provisions extend the deadlines um, and but require the payment of rent. Okay, hopefully that's helpful just an understanding sort of as we walk through it. What constitutes a force majeure event? Did it prevent performance here and to what extent? It's a high burden usually. And then three, well, what are the remedies if it does? <clears throat> So first question, um, what do I do in purchase and sale transactions when there is no force majeure provision in the contract? Um, it means two things. One is common law would apply. And I'll touch on that in a second. That's the impracticability defense. Uh, but number two, it might, it might mean, well, it does mean taking a look at the SEBA uh, force majeure addendum, which is on legal library now. And what that does is incorporate a force majeure provision into the contract. Whether that makes sense for your clients, again, is, is absolutely legal uh, and, and something you should involve an attorney in deciding. Here is that force majeure addendum, a lot of language, um, but this is it. This, this is a one pager basically. And you'll see again at the top, it, defi it defines what a force majeure is. You'll see the same elements we talked about earlier beyond the control of the party um, it cannot avoid it by exercising reasonable diligence. That's a little bit more detailed than the, the current provision in the leases. Um, and then it says, neither party shall be in default if and to the extent the performance is prevented by the force majeure event. So this is, those same three questions can be applied to every force majeure provision and this one, just to get a feel for understanding what it means. Um, not for advising your clients. Again, I know I sound like a broken record. Um, and then the next two paragraphs allow the parties to negotiate an extension of closing, allow an extension of other conditions. Um, we've had a lot of questions on this, both in the context of this addendum, but just in the context of clients who are asking, well, how long do I extend this for? We don't know anything about it. And I think that's exactly the takeaway. We don't know how long this is going to last. Um, the force majeure event has occurred now, arguably. And so more flexibility, as much flexibility as possible, uh, is generally preferred for buyers on one side of the transaction, and whereas sellers just kind of want to get it closed. 
Um, but either way, building in some flexibility uh, has been the preference uh, because we're accommodating new information every single day, um, both data about the virus, but also uh, about what activities inspectors are allowed to perform. Uh, I already told you that the original stay at home order is two weeks long. Um, so it's then might be extended, that might be modified, it might allow things like this, it might not. Um, so we know that at least through that period, there's going to be more information coming. And it'd be nice that once you get that information to then be able to set uh, a reasonable deadline for both parties, assuming everyone's uh, has a duty or is complying with their duty of good faith. I kind of mentioned that here again, the goal is just simply for the parties to agree on a new time period. Um, this this force majeure provision includes epidemics, so that's meant to resolve any question on that. Um, if you don't have this addendum, um, the parties should just assume that all the deadlines remain unchanged and all the contractual obligations remain unchanged and, and that's subject to the impracticability defense, which I'll talk, talk about in just a second and sort of which sort of wraps up the analysis to be thinking about uh, on this subject. Okay. Questions again, is this pandemic or the coronavirus generally included within the scope of a force majeure provision? I saw a few of these in the Q&A as well, and I, I kind of answered it. I mean, the, the lawyer answer is it depends on the, on the provision. I think you, hopefully you see that now and see why that's not just a boilerplate answer. But generally, I think it's pretty safe to assume it does. Uh, it's hard to imagine something of this magnitude not constituting a force majeure event. Uh, it seems to be the very reason why we include these provisions in the contract. I can't tell you how many times in my practice I was asked, well, what are all these boilerplate provisions at the back? And, and that's one of them. Um, you'll notice force majeure in the leases is, 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 a, is like A through G in section 33 of similar type provisions and meant to anticipate things like this. Um, and the last thing I'll just add from, I saw it in my notes again, is, is um, highly recommend, it's extremely important that, that you don't give that advice to your clients or say you went to a, attended a SIBA webinar and an attorney on there said it probably does. Again, that's for every provision and for every client to determine with their attorney. And then you can take whatever direction they want from that, uh, from that conversation and put it into effect. What if my client wants to invoke to force majeure clause? Similar, um, step one is talk to a lawyer. Step two might be talk to your lender for the client to talk to, uh, sorry, his or her lender or its lender. Um, amending material terms of a lease can certainly impact financing um, and the underlying financing documents. So if there's financing in place, that's another um, a good thing to recommend to your client is to make sure they're talking to their lender. Likely the lawyer will require a notice of the force majeure event to be sent out that's something we're doing. Um, although it seems obvious that this is occurring, you still need to give formal notice um, of invoking the provision. What if my client, a landlord, is unable to deliver the premises on time due to um, inability to perform tenant improvements or some other reason? Well, this is a good, that's a great question. So th this is what I I'm getting the most, or at least I think we probably all are seeing the most in terms of leasing context is, is about rent and then about um, generally I can't perform tenant improvements or I'm a tenant, I can't move my stuff in, things like that. So really just sort of transactional problems and headaches. Um, for the same analysis applies whether it's landlord or tenant with respect to extending deadlines or inability to perform. Um, the landlord would rely on the, would, would in consultation with their attorney, would see if the force majeure event, if this pandemic is, is preventing uh, performance. Um, it seems in this situation that that might be a strong argument. And then the deadline for uh, delivering the premises improved by tenant improvements would then need to be, or would be extended in this time period. And, and the, the lease provision um, is, purposeful in that it's somewhat vague and it allows the parties to wait and see, um, at least in this context, once it's allowed to do it, um, the, the deadline is essentially extended as, as much as necessary uh, for the tenant improvements to be performed. 
Going forward, should force majeure provisions provide for suspension of rent, assignment of benefits from tenant to landlord, or an option to terminate? It's a good question. I think everybody, uh, every lawyer and every broker is going to pay a lot more attention to the force majeure provisions going forward. Um, what changes we will see in them is really tough to predict. Um, there's some benefit in, in, in being vague. Um, the excluding rent is obviously a little bit uh, is landlord friendly, um, but generally um, it's, it's a reflection of the fact that a, most, a lot of landlords aren't in a great situation either. Um, I had a landlord client, client email me yesterday and it's getting extreme pressure from their lender uh, to still make payments on time. Now, again, that's something that with the stimulus package and, any, and other relief could change day to day. Um, and if that pressure is relieved off the landlord, then that pressure may be, uh, may be negotiated to be relieved off the tenant. Um, so I guess that's a long answer to say it possibly. Um, I think different parties under different circumstances will negotiate. We, we'll see more detail to force majeure provisions. I don't think we'll see that go as far as an option to terminate. Um, perhaps if it's an, you know, a six months or more or something like that. In standardized forms like we prepare for SEBA and Northwest MLS, um, that have to be general across all transactions and all parties. The idea is to pick something fair in the middle and, and not get into the weeds on things that might be specific to uh, one transaction or another. Should the SEBA force majeure addendum be used now or later when deadlines or the closing date are approaching? Um, another good question. I would say the sooner you start talking about it, the better. The better. And again, this is in purchase and sale transactions only. Um, the sooner you start talking about it, the better. Um, I'd be honest and say that most of our clients are sort of in a holding pattern on executing it because we don't yet know the timeline of the pandemic and of the response to it, the economy, lenders, all the different functions are sort of all in a holding pattern, uh, which makes it really tough. And so um, it's certainly good to start talking about it sooner. And, and the leasing side, Similar thing, uh, we're, I drafted an addendum the other day that the parties are kind of waiting to sign. Um, landlords are hesitant to want to waive the right to collect rent. Tenants are hesitant to uh, let so much rent accrue in the short term without knowing anything about the loans, at least not knowing with certainty about the loans that'll be available to them. So I've seen somewhat of a holding pattern there. Um, we do not currently have a force majeure addendum for the leases beyond what's already there. At this point, we think that's adequate as we are handling the sort of deluge of information that's coming in. Um, but the parties could agree together to extend closing dates in light of this. Um, but that's already sort of built into the provision. Okay, that's all the pre-submitted questions. I'll go to the Q&A now. Uh, if you have any, please don't hesitate to submit. Force majeure, hypothetically, if a tenant does not pay rent, will the sheriff follow through with an eviction? Will a landlord in this world follow through with default? Probably depends on a tenant's balance sheet, et cetera, but it sounds unlikely a landlord would be able to pursue. Would love your opinion. It's a great question, Jack. Um, the short answer is, well, there's a lot, there is no short answer. Um, in King County, well, I should say in the city of Seattle, there's a moratorium on commercial um, evictions for small businesses, that's 50 or fewer employees and nonprofits, in addition to the statewide a residential eviction moratorium. So if a residential tenant does not pay, uh, there is a moratorium that tenant cannot be evicted. That includes sending them the uh, unlawful detainer, the actual legal proceeding paperwork <clears throat> that can't be done, so you can't even commence it. Um, if it's a commercial tenant, uh, which I imagine most of you are, are interested in, it's important to keep in mind that the courts are still somewhat open, but those remedies are very limited, uh, at least in King County. Um, the commercial, again, I mentioned the commercial evictions, that's a moratorium in Seattle for small businesses. Uh, if you don't qualify as a small business with under 50 employees or a nonprofit, technically, yes, a landlord can proceed, and I think would be prudent to keep talking with the tenant about when rent is late and reserve all rights associated with that. Um, 
But at some point, uh, as, as Jack sort of implies, it becomes a practical analysis of what makes the most sense here. Taking a, um, a tenant to court right now is likely you'll find yourself in front of a judge who's much more friendly and sympathetic to the tenant whose business has been shut down because of the coronavirus than to a landlord. Um, but technically, legally, the landlord would still, in some jurisdictions, be able to proceed with that eviction. Whether that makes sense politically and financially is another question. Um, I, I'm personally counseling landlords to the greatest extent possible to have flexibility right now um, as we wait to see what sort of business loans are coming in. Um, but that's all governed by lender flexibility, of course. What if a buyer or seller requests time extensions for contract guidance due to a force majeure event? How is that handled? What is the typical duration? I think uh, right now there is no typical duration. I will tell you that. You know, it just depends on the flexibility of the party. Some, um, some sellers can be extremely flexible and are willing to take on the risk of that and will extend 90 days. Some sellers are feeling very nervous and want to keep the buyer under contract and get to closing as fast as possible. Um, but to the extent the parties can agree to extend a closing, um, use that force majeure event, <coughs> force majeure addendum, and just keep in mind the things I mentioned earlier, which are these governors could change his order or modify it. Um, really all the relief coming down from local all the way up to federal level is all on a temporary basis. So it's going to change. Um, we don't know how until that, that timeline comes. And even up until then, as we've seen with real estate, you're going to continue to get more and more guidance that changes your understanding of what you're allowed to do and what the, the, the parties and the inspectors and everyone involved in the transactions are allowed to do. Got a 1031 exchange question. I'll answer that very shortly. Um, we are in residential property management uh, that is essential. Does this include landscape uh, upkeeping? I, I would say no. Frankly, I don't, I don't know the real details of what property management is allowed to do since it just came down. Um, and it's been a very much a moving target over the last four or five days or so. But uh, the way I would uh, encourage you to look at it is, is the property management function you're performing necessary um, if for people finding housing, um, is it necessary for the system to the building so shelter is provided? I think if you're out, if you have a contractor out in the lawn performing landscaping, um, it's much more likely to draw the attention of authorities. I don't know what that means right now. Um, that's uh, enforcement is still very much in flux, uh, but I would recommend bypassing activities like that that don't seem essential for the day-to-day -day living operations of the essential business. A client of mine is about to enter into a purchase and sale agreement with a force majeure provision and seller is allowing buyer six months for a time extension due to the force majeure event. Additional extensions can then be requested, but the buyer cannot walk out due to the force majeure event. Is that fair? I'll refrain from giving you specific legal advice on your contract and your clients because uh, I can't do that, but I would generally say this is an example of, um, I, I'd say a much a very flexible seller um, with very flexible parties and six months might seem like a long time, but it's, it, it, we might be surprised that it's not, um, especially because you have to build in time at the end, not only for this pandemic to sub subside, but then for all of the feasibility and due diligence to be performed afterwards. Um, so I don't think this sounds like a, an unreasonable amount of time at all. And in fact, I've seen longer. What if remedies are not outlined in your force majeure clause? Well, that makes so it, it makes it more difficult. Um, so one is you, you still have common law remedies, which I'll touch on in a second, and I'm going to do so quickly. Um, that's impracticability. Um, but there has to be, in order for a force majeure event clause to work, I imagine there has to be something in there at the beginning because it can't just define a force majeure event and then say nothing about the impact of that. Um, if it does, then you're likely coming to the common law analysis uh, for some reason it does. And then you sort of maybe have better understanding of what, um, what raises to the level of, of impracticability, but you still have to get into the analysis of whether um, it's preventing performance. 
Interesting. What kind of demand, if any, can be made of non-paying commercial tenants who are already in default prior to the pandemic? Um, we certainly see a shortening of your remedies, unfortunately. Uh, it depends a little bit on where you are. Seattle is, I think, more straightforward. Um, but if you're outside of Seattle, um, my understanding is that you can still make the same demands. Um, you can still work with them. In some jurisdictions, we still, I still know uh, evictions are somewhat are, are proceeding in a commercial context, mostly in situations where the, sell, the, the, uh, the landlord just has no flexibility from their lender. But again, that's something that's changing by the day. Um, I think a landlord could get that flexibility. Um, and so I, I just wouldn't rush into court even if a tenant's already in default. And I think that's just really unfortunate circumstance uh, for, for this, that's a result of this unpredictable event. Here's a great question. Technically, is the force majeure event the pandemic or is it actually the stay at home order? Um, it can be either. Um, in case law, we frequently see the government orders being the basis uh, for a force majeure event. So that could be zoning changes, things like that, wetlands protection, um, a an industry becomes regulated or unregulated. Uh, so it can, be, it can be either and together they would create a more powerful argument, persuasive argument. When will commercial brokers have the same rights as residential brokers? That's a fair question. And we're dealing with a lot of animosity on the difference. But I, I think if, if we take a step back and all try to have some flexibility and understanding in this unusual situation, basically the real estate industry is not considered essential except for people who need homes. You need house, uh, a roof over their heads. And if they're stuck in limbo between one place and another, that's where the governor wanted to help out. And the governor did not want to go far beyond that. Um, and we could argue all day about um, certain clients performing essential activities and should we be allowed to do that? And we might see some modification of the order on that. But I, I would reframe your question to look more at the reason real residential brokers are allowed to do anything at all is because it involves a basic human need uh, that's relevant to public health. Here's an anecdote, which is interesting and, and relevant to Jack's question. The sheriff was scheduled for a commercial eviction three weeks ago, unrelated to COVID, but the sheriff would not evict following the Seattle moratorium. Um, so we have directions from the Seattle sheriff that came down after, from the King County sheriff that came down after uh, the statewide residential moratorium was enacted, which said sheriffs cannot go enforce evictions. Um, this is, that's not a sheriff's favorite job to do. Um, I've done a lot of evictions myself and are never thrilled uh, to be evicting anybody. Um, so it doesn't surprise me that there's some difficulty there and that's good information for everybody to know in the city. Okay, under, and I want to move on because we only have a few more, more minutes left. So I'm going to, I'm going to wait on a couple of these and circle back at the end. Okay. Um, no force majeure provision. I'll go kind of fast here since we're running uh, slow on time, but I think that should be easy. Um, so here is sort of what the general law is across most states and has been embraced by Washington. And the key word is impracticable. Um, it's a, it's, it, which, which means, as I said below down there, extremely and unreasonably difficult. So again, when something occurs that causes it extremely, it makes it extremely and unreasonably difficult to perform. And it's not the fault of a non-party. Um, then there, uh, there may be a performance may be excused. And what that means with purchase and sale agreements is closing may altogether be forgiven. Uh, the contract is terminated. This happens, for instance, in a residential transaction when the purchaser dies away or dies or passes away. It's a strong argument that that contract should be terminated altogether. Um, for leasing, who knows? Uh, you must assume all remedies are possible. These aren't making, these arguments aren't making their way to court yet, so we don't really know, but you could argue a rent payment's impracticable. Uh, so if you're trying to evict a tenant, a commercial tenant, um, outside of, of the city of Seattle, 
they will make the argument, uh, regardless of a force majeure provision, that it's impracticable for them to pay rent right now because they have no clients and no customers. And if a judge is persuaded by that, then they will not uh, evict the tenant. I included some cases in the slide that I won't go into a great detail here. Um, I'll just give you the takeaway, and this is how impracticability has been interpreted in Washington uh, over the, the history. And the big takeaway is financial difficulty usually is not enough. And that has been a clear, bright line. It might be tested with these current circumstances because this is so unprecedented. Um, but just keep in mind, generally, the party who's claiming that they cannot perform is the one who has the burden to show it and to show that there is a force majeure event, or there's an event outside of their control and then show that it's causing uh, their inability to perform. And with impracticability, there's an obligation to explore all available solutions to that. Um, so all available inspection solutions with notary, all available solutions to get a document notarized. Um, here's a case where it says very clearly, financial inability is not equivalent to impossibility to perform. Okay, on to questions, and I want to move pretty quickly through these, uh, but I'll try to be as thorough as I can. Uh, how do we address contract deadlines for properties that are under contract to sell and do not have a force majeure provision? I.e.g. feasibility period is set to expire or the buyer cannot inspect occupied um, multifamily units. Talk to a lawyer is number one. You're getting in, uh, your client's getting in hot water here because they might not be able to perform under a contract which means they need to know, do they have a defense available? And that would be the impracticability defense. So you're, the lawyer would look at all those things I just mentioned. Is it beyond their control? Is there nothing else they can do? Is it, is it pre truly preventing the ability to, uh, to close on the contract? Um, and then once they have that information with their lawyer, they're better suited to go to the other party and try to negotiate uh, an extension of deadlines for feasibility, for inspection of units, et cetera. Um, and if you have a persuasive argument accordingly, hopefully a landlord, or sorry, a seller uh, would, ag would agree to extend those deadlines if they can. We've got a lot of questions on this. This is interesting. Does the pandemic qualify for a proportionate rent reduction because the premise is untenable? The untenable provision is within the larger provision on property destruction. At this point, we do not think that is a feasible argument. Um, it, because at least in the SEBA forms, it starts with if the property is destroyed, now you could get creative and make an argument about whether this essentially destroys the property's usefulness because you can't go there. Um, so that, that could come up in court, but at this point I would not uh, see that as a very strong legal claim or legal defense. Okay, I'm gonna wait to answer questions on that session till the end to make sure I get to two or three main points here. Um, here are some just general takeaways that I've provided really already that I won't re restate in, in the interest of time. But the idea is presenting a business case for, for what you can do is for reasonable parties is usually what makes the most sense. Um, how are landlords and tenants of multifamily properties impacted? We covered that, so I'm gonna proceed. Um, so I did wanna touch on evictions. I've largely already done that. So. Keep in mind, residential and commercial are different. A governor has prohibited residential evictions for 30 days. This does not apply to commercial, but the city of Seattle mayor has prohibited evictions of some businesses, um, small businesses of 50 or fewer, and nonprofits. Also keep in mind that court availability is very limited right now, and judges will likely be lenient. lenient. Uh, this... If a landlord defers tenant's rent payment, should the landlord obtain a promissory note uh, to fix repayment of time? I, I would say it's a creative solution, something to talk about with your lawyer, but generally um, you already have an obligation to pay. So unless the tenant's taking on new obligations, which can be done in an amendment, there, there likely isn't a huge benefit. I answered this uh, earlier, I believe, but uh, just be flexible. <laughs> And here's the last one I want to make sure I got to before I circle back on questions. Are 1031 exchange deadlines being extended? At this point, I don't think so. The guide, I know that there's been a lot of effort on this, uh, but my understanding is we do not have guidance yet. I reached out to a facilitator this morning to get up to date. I haven't received a reply back, but I do not believe yet formally there's any decision on this, though it sure seems like something we can expect. 
And the final point, remote online notarization. Um, so I would say work with your escrow and title companies on this, reach out to them. Um, different vendors are being used. I think Chicago Title is using Notary Cam, which I put there. Um, this, the governor is accelerated. This is a, for a 30 day period, it's temporary. And, and then again, we'll see if it gets extended, but best to reach out to escrow and title um, for their recommendations on vendors that comply with Washington's law. You have to be present and you have to be seen um, and heard in order for that to work. Okay, um, we are at 12. I'm happy to kind of clear out the questions here in the queue. Um, as long as this webinar keeps going, uh, that's fine with me. So if we get cut off at any point, thank you for tuning in. I'll follow up perhaps with answering these questions by an email, um, but until we get cut off, I I'll continue answering them. Okay. Um, how you would you advise tenants who wish to enter into a new lease during the COVID-19 crisis? So that's something we touched on earlier. It's just tough flexibility. Um, the best practices for new leases rent in the COVID era is pay, pay special attention to force majeure. Um, but again, you've got to think a lot about who you're renting to. I know I've heard concerns about renting to small businesses now because you're limited in your ability um, to evict them on the short term which is a really unfortunate circumstance and an unfortunate way to look at it. Um, but there's just so much up in the air right now that to the extent possible, um, we are counseling our landlord clients to hold. Uh, tenants might not be able to pay rent and landlords might not be able to deliver the premises as, ne as necessary for the tenant. Um, but if it's needed, um, there's some protections, but at the end of the day, you know, the, the contract itself is your protection. And if you are unable to enforce it in court, uh, because of moratoriums or elsewhere, else uh, or other reasons, it can be difficult. How are force majeure judgments being made typically? We don't really have any, uh, to tell you the truth, at least on COVID. Um, I included some examples in the slides that you can look at before. Generally, courts have been very, very hesitant to excuse performance under contracts, but this is an extraordinary circumstance. Um, Uh, let's see here. In other leases, I'm oh, sorry, in a lease other than new leases where tenants are in their abatement or tenant improvement period, what good does the force majeure provision do when the major uh, detriment a tenant is facing is defaulting? Uh, it's a fair question. Uh, the obligation to pay rent is really the biggest obligation for a tenant, and that's excluded. It's frankly, it's excluded because um, landlords still need to make mortgage payments. That's what we anticipated and anticipate in general. Um, and that's very consistent across force majeure provisions that we've seen. Um, so is that something that parties will negotiate differently going forward? Possibly. Um, if a tenant has negotiating power sufficient enough to uh, ex exclude the payment of rent in the event of a force majeure provision, then again, that gets to the negotiating leverage of the parties. Hunter, I'm going to interrupt you for just a moment. Can you end the slideshow so that we see you as a black screen? Oh no, I'm gonna be huge. Okay, I did Thank that. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Kristen. You're welcome. Okay. Um, will a replay of your webinar be available for reviewing in the next few days? Yes, absolutely. Can notary cam can or cannot be enforceable in Washington? I, I don't know. I don't do, I, I haven't done any remote notaries yet. The idea is that now in Washington, you can do electronic remote notarizations. If you comply with all the requirements, that's a valid ID that the notary can see you and hear you. And there's some other uh, very specific limitations and there are vendors that can satisfy those. I don't make any representation, nor do I represent on behalf of anybody else, whether any vendor can. I know that'd be helpful, I'm sorry, but I'm just not an expert on that. I'd say reach out to your title companies and your escrow companies about what vendors they're using and whether they perform that service. And I know title and escrow companies are doing that now. Uh, so if you need to keep looking, uh, do that. Can you please put up the information on the mobile notary? I can. 
Um, though there, it is not complete. It is, there are a lot of requirements that I did not list. Let's see if I can find it. So I'm going to share a screen now so you can see that for a second. It didn't work. Okay, there it is. Um, Chris McDougall just wrote in and, and noticed that NAR is lobbying in Washington, D.C. to include an extension of the 1031 deadlines in a relief package that will be taken up at the end of April. So that's great. Thanks for providing that. Should tenants and landlords be able to go to their bank to get a lease notarized? Um, I would say do the electronic notarization, but that's that's your easy way out to a complicated question. Oh, make sure I've got the right. There's that. Um, I'm just trying to get this here. Under a commercial lease, does force majeure exclude things like premises insurance, uh, which thereby tenant must continue with making insurance premiums and making necessary repairs and maintenance to the premises? Yes, I, I would say yes, it does. It, it's meant to apply to deadlines and extending those, uh, but obligations in general are not completely suspended under the lease. That would, in effect, be terminating the lease temporarily. Is it required and or enforceable that both buyers and sellers in a contract uh, now add and agree to the CBA Force Majeure document? Uh, it's not required. We believe it's enforceable uh, if the parties execute it, but certainly not required. All we're trying to do is give a form to the folks who are trying to negotiate an extension of deadlines and the, it, the form itself is meant to explain why. Tenant has multiple locations, but not 50 at any given location. Would they be considered a large or a small business? Um, I need to review the statute or sorry, the, the rule, the, the proclamation to be absolutely certain. But my understanding is, does your entity have 50 employees? Uh, but that's a good question. I, I don't know the specifics on that, but, but you can access, uh, if you want to email me, I can get back to you on that, but you can also access the order yourself and see if that answers it. Uh, let's see here. Once the governor's restrictions are lifted, if a, a force majeure addendum is not already in place with a closing extension and the closing deadline arrives, does it mean that force majeure is no longer applicable? Uh, no, not necessarily. It means force majeure would not be applicable because there would be no force majeure clause in the contract if, an ad if the addendum to the PSA hasn't been executed. But impracticability would still be there, which is a very similar analysis uh, but different. And, and that is the common law argument that I'm unable to close this transaction because of circumstances outside of my control. And uh, the buyer in that case would have a, a heavy burden to show why and that it prevented performance and that they did everything in their power to close. If a client needs to view a commercial property because of time constraints, can the owner show it without any commercial brokers present? Um, those time, the time constraints, I would, I'm very curious what those would be in order to be so essential, but under the current order, uh, 
Um, viewing commercial property is not a part of an essential business or an essential activity. And so it's not only you, but your client is supposed to stay home and not perform activities that are not considered essential uh, in order to prevent the spread of this virus. Uh, so I think this is about the force majeure addendum itself. I'm assuming it's possible for elements of paragraph two to come into play while others may not, may not. For example, maybe we are able to meet some deadlines and some contingencies, but not others that would require more time. That's correct. So the idea, uh, and I don't have it pulled up here in front of me, but the idea is you could kind of fashion that. Let me just pull it up. Yeah, so just to read it again, uh, if through no fault of buyer or seller and by reason of a force majeure event, any condition or condi uh, contingency in the agreement cannot be completed, then all time periods in the applicable contingency or condition, including the time periods for the related notices, shall be extended. So just it depends a lot on what sort of contingencies you have. With the SEBA agreement, uh, it's clearly intended to focus on the feasibility contingency, which is sort of broad. But if there's other contingencies as well, that would likely be covered. All time periods uh, in the applicable contingency or condition. So uh, be really careful in specifying which condition, contingency or condition is at issue. Um, and then you can use this to extend that. Okay, uh, that's all my questions that I have in the queue. Thank you for everyone uh, that participated. Uh, was, those were great questions and I'll turn it back over to Kristen now. Okay, thank you Hunter so much for doing this presentation for us. We really appreciate it. And thank you everyone for attending. If at any time you lost your internet connection, we did record this, so it will be available on the SIBA website. And if you have colleagues who are also interested, you can let them know that they will be able to find it there. So thank you very much for attending and Hunter, thank you very much. Yeah, absolutely, happy to help. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.